Okay. All right, I'm going to kick this off with the ACL. Now, first thing to note, this is the first statutory modification to the common law contract that you guys have probably been uh, associated with. Those next year, you're going to get a bunch of others. You're going to have, you can hear, is it too loud? Not loud enough? Do I need to enunciate? Oh, there's echo. Well, it is. Yeah, it is. I've got the microphone here. How about I turn the mic down? I turn the mic down. I'm just going to talk a little louder. Is that better? All right. So the, um, this is the first statutory modification you guys are going to have to the common law rules of contract. So you need to know whenever you are dealing with contracts that are modified by statute, the common law is always still there. It is just masked, stopped, modified, pushed around, and mapped out by a statutory framework. Here it's to do with um, consumer laws, and, and, and the, um, we, while we're talking about the Australian Consumer Law, it's actually the broader Competition and Consumer Act. There are a series of other pieces of legislation that also modify contracts. Um, the Land Titles Act says contract for land have to be in writing. Property Law Act does the well, pretty much the same thing. Land title registers stuff. Um, the Fair Work Act modifies contracts for employment. Um, you can have the contracts for residential tenancy. Who's ever signed a lease for residential tenancy under the RTRA? And all of those things modify the common law. But if you go and read those statutes, it will use words like agreement. It is an agreement to do this and an agreement to do that. It's all grounded in this stuff. Even though it seems like the laws of ye old England, the stuff we're doing in this subject uh, is actually the law of the state of Queensland and the Commonwealth of Australia. But in this particular case, the modifications are, are actually pretty, uh, pretty steep. They do a variety of changes. Now, the older older-ish amongst us might remember something called the Trade Practices Act. The Trade Practices Act was a statute, and I've noted that not many people seem to know this, including Steve, actually. Uh, the Trade Practices Act never got repealed. It's interesting. They, whenever they create new legislation, Parliament takes extra special care to not change things where there is a lot of common law in place. They're very, very careful about doing this. And in fact, when the Trade Practices Act um, became the, Australia, the uh, Competition and uh, Consumer Act, that not only did they not change it, they actually just renamed it. So the amending act literally said, this is now called this act. We'll renumber some of the sections. This section's now this, this section's now that. And we're going to give it a schedule, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, but just make note, there's one important constitutional difference between them. And that is, the Trade Practices Act only applied to corporations. And so when I did contract law with Rachel, many moons ago, I couldn't believe how dumb the system was where you had to learn a whole bunch of rules that applied. When you're dealing with somebody, you had to know whether they were operating on behalf of their company or whether they're operating under an ABN as a sole trader or a partner or as a trustee of a trust or some other mechanism. It was really dumb. It's a dumb system. Of, when you're dealing with people, you don't have any commercial um, Certainty. You don't know how what the rules are in relation to people. It's, it was I had no idea how the system worked, but it seemed to work. It seemed to buy people. Didn't seem to care. Um, and a bunch of stuff that was in the Fair Trading Act, which has now been repealed, seemed to work similar to the ACL uh, to the Trade Practices Act. But nonetheless, what happened after the Work Choices case in 2007? Uh, work Choices case, and uh, had something of a bit of a conservative bent to it they stretched uh, some of the constitutional powers, particularly section 51, subsection 20, which is the corporation's power. Work Choices case stretched it a lot and said that that power gives the federal government a whole bunch of power to legislate, which kind of scared some of the state lawmakers, I have to say, at the time. Justice Kirby dissented quite strongly in that case. Um, Similarly, when you guys do things like administrative law, you look at the ACF case, that's to do with the external affairs power, that gave the federal government more and more power. There seems to be this trend, by the way, in Australian constitutional history, the states get less and less power, and the Commonwealth government gets more and more. 
But, strictly speaking, the federal government does not have power to legislate over contracts. It does not have that power under Section 51. So it's a reserve power of the states. How did they get around this? They asked the states very nicely. And so what happened as a result, when the ACL came in place to make it uniform across Australia, they literally asked all the states if they could refer their powers to the federal parliament to do this. And so Section 16 of the Fair Trading Act in Queensland says for the Australian Consumer Law, which is Schedule 2, of the Competition and uh, Consumer Act 2010 is now a law of the state of Queensland. And that means when you rock up to QCAT, a Queensland tribunal, to hear your civil dispute between consumers and traders or traders and traders below a certain threshold of $25,000, you can argue stuff from the ACL as if it were Queensland law for that reason. It's, um, it's just how it's, it's enshrined here. You see, it's a much, much better system. Um, uh, but the purpose of the CCA is much broader than just the Australian Consumer Law because the idea is, well, even though the Australian Consumer Law you think would just apply to consumers, it's actually a little bit broader than that as well. But generally, it's to do and involved with the conduct, particularly of businesses. Now, it's a little bit more complex than that. And, uh, yeah, I'll flip the slide. And the reason for that is not everything in the Australian consumer law actually requires you to be a consumer, and not everything in the Australian consumer law requires the person doing the thing or supplying the goods or granting land or whatever to be in trade and commerce. But most of them do. Most of them do. And in particular, the consumer guarantees require the person acquiring the goods to be a consumer. All the time. Okay, um, and this is a pretty important point. When you are a consumer, it you can rock up to Officeworks and go and buy some stationery, all right? And you're going to be protected by the consumer guarantees, section I think it's 54 to 65 plus or minus of the ACL, all right? And if you were rocking up on behalf of your company, if you've got a company, you can register a company. It, be the sole director, sole shareholder, 100 shares, it's your company. Um, the key thing to note in this country, this doesn't seem to happen very often. People have ABNs for whatever reason. And I thought that was crazy. And then I found out how much it costs to register a company in this country. It's $490. And you've got to pay an annual fee of $150. I set a company up in New Zealand, it cost me 50 bucks. And I did it online in 2001 and paid no annual registration fee. It's a little bit more than that now. But it's really, really easy. So, I don't know, it sounds terrible. So, every man and his dog has a company, and that was that's the, the preferred vessel of doing business. Um, every man and his dog, every man, woman, and the dogs are very naughty people who register companies in the names of all sorts of entities. In fact, the reason they now charge more money is just because it was too easy. Um, Eastern European gangs were going and registering them, New Zealand companies. But no, here that if you are a business and you rock up to office work, you are also protected under the consumer guarantees. And that kind of makes sense because if I'm getting a stapler from office works, it's so dumb to have a different set of rules depending if I'm buying it for, a, you know, to use in my business for stapling things as opposed to me using it privately to staple things. It's a really dumb system to have that. But there is a gotcha um, and that is that, look, if I'm buying a thousand staplers and I'm on selling them, that's not going to fly. You can't rely on the consumer guarantees for one of those thousand staplers and the, the high bar that it sets um, for most things there. So just make note that you're always going to get it as a consumer regardless of the dollar amount and you will get it as a business if the amounts are, um, are I think it's below $40,000. $40,000? $40, $40,000. And you're not resupplying them. The purpose of resupply or manufacture or plopping them, I think attaching them to land. Those things will push you outside the scope. Um, I've actually noticed uh, the tradies exception at Bunnings. You guys have seen that? You guys, who, who here goes to Bunnings for fun? I'm interested because I suspect, yeah, I suspect there's an age thing here. Or it's, uh, something's happened in my head and I, my treat is going to Bunnings. And um, 
But you'll notice that when you go through, they have this, this thing, you won't get a, a, a warranty on power drills and stuff if you're using it as a, as a contractor. Um, and I think they've done their homework on that. Yep. Possibly. Maybe. I, it depends on the terms of that card when you apply for it. Because it could be. You literally could be saying, I'm using this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm using it. I'm giving you a discount for these things to not apply. And I can only under this. Because the other thing to note about the Australian Consumer Law, you can't contract out of it. Um, later on, I'll do the Sale of Goods Act, which is a set of rules that you can contract out of. Powerful parties can do that. But we consider weaker parties to not be able to do that. And this, again, it's this purpose of resupply, transforming them in trade and commerce uh, in the course of process of production or manufacturing, course of preparing trading other goods and things like that. You know, I, I, yeah, I would actually argue a power drill would probably be fine for that. But I, I suspect that the way that it's written in the agreement is probably to say, we'll give you this discount if you are using it under these things. Um, you're not using it for personal, domestic, or uh, household use, I would imagine. I have to go and read. Anyway, that definition, again, doesn't apply everywhere. Only applies to the particular sections that use that. Uh, another definition um, is in trade and commerce. Again, not all sections does this apply to, but many of them do. And that is actually pretty much the common law definition as well. What's trade and commerce? Doing things like you would do a business. Buying stuff and selling stuff. Um, Concrete Constructions and Nelson, that's essentially what the court said. Look, this, it's a commonsensical rule. Um, <laughs> Queensland Justice Society, not in trade and commerce. Education providers, public education providers, not in, not in trade and commerce. Um, uh, this has actually become a, something of a discussion in law staff meetings when they're marketing the law degree. Hmm. Are we in trade and commerce? No. So this stuff doesn't apply. Hmm. Uh, what else doesn't apply? Um, a whole bunch of large entities. Um, ABC, public entities generally, are, are usually exempt from the ACL um, for a, a, in a variety of areas. Um, but many of them are also not in trade and commerce. Um, charities and such like. All right, I'm going to go through, through some sections. This pretty quickly. And then we're going to go talk about Section 18 in particular. So I'm going to start with Section 18. Uh, a person must not trade in commerce, engage in conduct, which is misleading and deceptive, or is likely to mislead or deceive. Um, I've paraphrased all of these to just get the good bits out of them, because they'll have all sorts of exceptions. Uh, like the previous one was, um, you know, that you're not a consumer if you're doing this. And then there's an exception for gift cards. Oh, boy, they needed to put it in there. Um, so I'm going to go and refer to this, but the key thing to note here is that in trade and commerce, in trade and commerce, section 18, miscellaneous of the party that you're trying to take action against must be in trade and commerce. I cannot take my action against the Queensland Justice Association under section 18. I had to do it in the common law. You still have that right to take that action. I couldn't use section 18. Person must not trade and commerce, make false. Uh, these other two don't come up much. I think this one's to do with employment, that one's to do with land. Um, I'm, I don't go into these in any depth in this course because Section 18 is vastly, overwhelmingly used because the um, application is wider than these other ones. It's just something to note. Just make note, they, this one, uh, one of them has the trade and commerce element, whereas this one doesn't, I don't think. I don't think it does. It's just in relation to employment. Those aren't the main ones. Uh, just also note, so section 18, we need to know for this subject. You don't need to know the other two. And this next slide, you do need to know these two. They have to do with unconscionable conduct. So they are the statutory equivalent of undue influence and, undue, uh, and unconscionable conduct. Both thrown in together. Um, and it says they're within the meaning of the unwritten law. What is that? What's the unwritten law? Common law. It's the rules of common law and actually equity in this case as well. Things that judges have said and have been written down. It actually is written down. What judges have said. Um, again, I'll go over those at a, a stage later in the subject when we do um, those. All right. Uh, unfair terms and contracts. This is a stat definition of, un of unfair. Again, no mention of trade and commerce. 
just to do with standard form contracts. Uh, also know ACL section 50, when we do duress. Duress, common law duress, is a pretty relatively narrow application. It's still much wider than misrepresentation than mistake. Here, this has got an incredibly wide ambit. And there's a reason for that. We don't want people to go around threatening, break people's kneecaps. So it doesn't have a trade and commerce element. It's just got in connection with supply and or payment of goods, services, or interests in land. It's much broader. All right, there's a host of, um, oh, what do they call them, sort of unfair practices, pyramid selling, bait advertising. They're actually reasonably specific things, but these have been brought about over the last 50 years. Really, really annoying practices that particular entities have realized they've been able to do and they've got around the various legal standards at the time. Um, pyramid scheme, what's a pyramid scheme? This is for young fellas, I mean, I imagine... Oh, bless the, 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 old, the over uh, 35s in the room would have seen these things. They didn't used to be unlawful. Yeah, yeah things basically where you get somebody, the, you, with your business model essentially based on you selling the right to sell the product. And you pay a large sum of money. And the idea is that that person has to get eight, ten, five, however many more people to do that. And then those people have to go and get eight or five, ten more people to do that. Comes in a pyramid, you get all the money at the top. And eventually the pyramid breaks down because you can't get more people because no one wants to do it anymore. Um, and that is basically the structure. The federal parliament said, no, nah, you can't do that. It causes so much heartache. Um, because, <laughs> oh, that is a very good question. They just managed to skirt around having their revenue and having their product based on the product as opposed to the referral aspect. Uh, Multi-level marketing. Uh, John Oliver did a really good piece uh, on that. If you guys get a chance, HBO, um, go and watch that. It's very, very, very good. Talk about that. Yeah, that, yeah. I agree. By the way, I agree. I found almost all of those things to be intensely dislikable. All right. So there's a bunch of sections. These only apply to consumers. So these consumer guarantees you get when you purchase stuff as a consumer and you're buying stuff from people who, who sell these sorts of things. Now, I've got the SOGA rules as well. And I'll probably do a separate lecture or part of a lecture for the Sale of Goods Act, um, which is SOGA, Sale of Goods Act, um, because these are the equivalents. There's one very important different, which difference, which is section 64. All of the, those equivalents in the Sale of Goods Act, which is the default. So if you have a contract for the Sale of Goods, by default, all of the rules in the Sale of Goods Act apply to it. You can contract out of any of them. You can expressly say, I don't guarantee goods are of, um, that Sale of Goods uses merchantable quality. Um, I don't guarantee this is fitness for, fit for any particular purpose. I don't guarantee that there are any undisclosed securities. I don't guarantee that I have title. You can put all of those things in a common law contract and that'll trump the Sale of Goods Act. You cannot do that with consumer guarantees because section 64 of the ACL says so. Um, there's a good TV show. You used to get it on iView with the guys from The Chaser. Um, Craig and um, the unfunny one, Julian. They, um, they do a TV show called The Checkout, um, which you can check it out. Sorry. I haven't really been waiting for that for a long time to do, but uh, okay. Uh, so just note, the, um, this is the remedies for stuff anywhere in the Australian consumer law. They are basically giving powers to the court to do a wide variety of things. At common law, they can't do all of this stuff. Under the Australian Consumer Law, if you can get it under the statute, they can do all of these things. Uh, for example, varying the contract. The courts of common law can't do that. They can't modify a contract. They can in equity. It's called rectification. If there's a um, you know, mis uh, uh, misreading of uh, the intention of the parties, the court can rectify to um, reflect their intention, but they do that in equity. If it's under the Australian Consumer Law, the courts can do all of the above. At the time, how fast. And if it's a consumer contract, you can also get these things as well. And again, there's two broad categories. We've got a major failure or a minor failure of your particular product. Um, and look, this is pretty, pretty harsh. 
I um, just point this out. I, I had a business years ago with a friend of mine when we were, I was in, I was in my final year of uni, I think, the first or second time around, doing my philosophy degree. And we started a business building computers. And we sold a computer to a guy. And I, at the time I was 22, and the guy we sold to was 20, and my business partner was 18. So we actually went to the equivalent of QCAT and had to have a hero, which is quite remarkable. You'd never see that like anywhere else with people that young because it was a business. It was a business um, operation. The guy was looking, he was actually very sympathetic to us. You know, the economy needs people going out and doing all of this sort of stuff. And, um, but it all came down to the equivalent of these sections in the equivalent, and it was the New Zealand uh, Fair Trading Act 1986. And, um, and so I, I got to learn about all this stuff firsthand actually in the tribunal as a 22 year old doing philosophy um, and uh, so just know that they, they separate that into two a major failure if it's a big one you get the opportunity to send the stuff back um, whereas if it's something that can be remedied if it's something that can be remedied the seller does get the opportunity to do that so don't think when you go even as a consumer you have an automatic right to refund goods you actually don't you don't actually do that you have to it has to be a major failure in those particular goods okay I'm going to, only because there's some switching time, we're switching things over, I'm going to end this part of the lecture. I'm going to give you, unfortunately, five minutes break because the YouTube, I'm clicking it now.